John Stuart Mill says in his Principles of Political Economy, quote, It is questionable if all the mechanical inventions yet made have lightened the day's toil of any human being. End of quote. Footnote 1. Mill should have said, quote, Of any human being not fed by other people's labor. End of quote. For without doubt, machinery has greatly increased the number of well-to-do idlers. End of footnote 1. That is, however, by no means the aim of the capitalistic application of machinery. Like every other increase in the productiveness of labor, machinery is intended to cheapen commodities, and, by shortening that portion of the working day in which the laborer works for himself, to lengthen the other portion that he gives without an equivalent to the capitalist. In short, it is a means for producing surplus value. In manufacture, the revolution in the mode of production begins with the labor power, in modern industry it begins with the instruments of labor. Our first inquiry, then, is how the instruments of labor are converted from tools into machines, or what is the difference between a machine and the implements of a handicraft. We are only concerned here with striking and general characteristics, for epochs in the history of society are no more separated from each other by hard and fast lines of demarcation than are geological epochs. Mathematicians and mechanicians, and in this air followed by a few English economists, call a tool a simple machine and a machine a complex tool. They see no essential difference between them, and even give the name of machine to the simple mechanical powers, the lever, the inclined plane, the screw, the wedge, etc. Footnote 2. See, for instance, Hutton, Course of Mathematics. End of footnote 2. As a matter of fact, every machine is a combination of those simple powers, no matter how they may be disguised. From the economic standpoint, this explanation is worth nothing, because a historical element is wanting. Another explanation of the difference between tool and machine is that in the case of a tool, man is the motive power, while the motive power of a machine is something different from man, as for instance an animal, water, wind, and so on. Footnote 3. Quote, from this point of view, we may draw a sharp line of distinction between a tool and a machine, spades, hammers, chisels, etc., combinations of levers and of screws, in all of which, no matter how complicated they may be in other respects, man is a motive power. All this falls under the idea of a tool, but the plough, which is drawn by animal power, and windmills, etc., must be classed among machines. End of quote. Wilhelm Schultz, Die Bewegung der Produktion, Zurich, 1843, page 38. In many respects, a book to be recommended. End of footnote 3. According to this, a plough drawn by oxen, which is a contrivance common to the most different epochs, would be a machine. According to this, a plough drawn by oxen, which is a contrivance common to the most different epochs, would be a machine while Clausen's circular loom, which, worked by a single laborer, weaves 96,000 picks per minute, would be a mere tool. Nay, this very loom, though a tool when worked by hand, would, if worked by steam, be a machine. And since the application of animal power is one of man's earliest inventions, production by machinery would have preceded production by handicrafts. When in 1735 John Wyatt brought out his spinning machine and began the industrial revolution of the 18th century, not a word did he say about an ass driving it instead of a man, and yet this part fell to the ass. He described it as a machine, quote, to spin without fingers, end of quote. Footnote 4. Before this time, spinning machines, although very imperfect ones, had already been used, and Italy was probably the country of their first appearance. A critical history of technology would show how little any of the inventions of the 18th century are the work of a single individual. Hitherto there is no such book. Darwin has interested us in the history of nature's technology, I in the formation of the organs of plants and animals, which organs serve as instruments of production for sustaining life. Does not the history of the productive organs of man, of organs that are the material basis of all social organization, deserve equal attention? And would not such a history be easier to compile, since, as Vico says, human history differs from natural history in this, that we have made the former but not the latter? Technology discloses man's mode of dealing with nature. 
the process of production by which he sustains his life, and thereby also lays bare the mode of formation of his social relations and of the mental conceptions that flow from them. Every history of religion, even, that fails to take account of this material basis is uncritical. It is in reality much easier to discover by analysis the earthly core of the misty creations of religion than, conversely, it is to develop from the actual relations of life the corresponding celestialized forms of those relations. The latter method is the only materialistic and therefore the only scientific one. The weak points in the abstract materialism of natural science a materialism that excludes history and its process, are at once evident from the abstract and ideological conceptions of its spokesmen whenever they venture beyond the bounds of their own speciality. End of footnote 4 All fully developed machinery consists of three essentially different parts, the motor mechanism, the transmitting mechanism, and finally the tool or working machine. The motor mechanism is that which puts the whole in motion. It either generates its own motive power, like the steam engine, the caloric engine, the electromagnetic machine, etc., or it receives its impulse from some already existing natural force, like the water wheel from a head of water, the windmill from wind, etc. The transmitting mechanism, composed of flywheels, shafting, toothed wheels, pulleys, straps, ropes, bands, pinions, and gearing of the most various kinds, regulates the motion, changes its form where necessary, as for instance from linear to circular, and divides and distributes it among the working machines. These two first parts of the whole mechanism are there solely for putting the working machines in motion, by means of which motion the subject of labor is seized upon and modified as desired. The tool or working machine is that part of the machinery with which the industrial revolution of the 18th century started and to this day it constantly serves as such a starting point whenever a handicraft or a manufacture is turned into an industry carried on by machinery. On a closer examination of the working machine proper, we find in it as a general rule, though often no doubt under very altered forms, the apparatus and tools used by the handicraftsman or manufacturing workman. With this difference, that instead of being human implements, they are the implements of a mechanism or mechanical implements. Either the entire machine is only a more or less altered mechanical edition of the old handicraft tool, as for instance the power loom, footnote 5, especially in the original form of the power loom, we recognize at the first glance the ancient loom. In its modern form, the power loom has undergone essential alterations, end of footnote 5, or the working parts fitted in the frame of the machine are old acquaintances, as spindles are in a mule, needles in a stocking loom, saws in a sawing machine, and knives in a chopping machine. The distinction between these tools and the body proper of the machine exists from their very birth, for they continue for the most part to be produced by handicraft or by manufacture, and are afterwards fitted into the body of the machine, which is the product of machinery. Footnote 6. It is only during the last fifteen years, i.e. since about 1850, that a constantly increasing portion of these machine tools have been made in England by machinery, and that not by the same manufacturers who make the machines. Instances of machines for the fabrication of these mechanical tools are the automatic bobbin-making engine, the card-setting engine, shuttle-making machines, and machines for forging mule and throstle spindles. End of footnote 6. The machine proper is therefore a mechanism that, after being set in motion, performs with its tools the same operations that were formerly done by the workmen with similar tools. Whether the motive power is derived from man or from some other machine makes no difference in this respect. From the moment that the tool proper is taken from man and fitted into a mechanism, a machine takes the place of a mere implement. The difference strikes one at once, even in those cases where man himself continues to be the prime mover. The number of implements that he himself can use simultaneously is limited by the number of his own natural instruments of production, by the number of his bodily organs. In Germany they tried at first to make one spinner work two spinning wheels, that is, to work simultaneously with both hands and both feet. This was too difficult. Later, a treadle spinning wheel with two spindles was invented, 
but adepts in spinning who could spin two threads at once were almost as scarce as two-headed men. The jenny, on the other hand, even at his very birth, spun with twelve to eighteen spindles, and the stocking loom knits with many thousand needles at once. The number of tools that a machine can bring into play simultaneously is from the very first emancipated from the organic limits that hedge in the tools of a handicraftsman. In many manual implements, the distinction between man as a mere motive power and man as a workman or operator properly so called is brought into striking contrast. For instance, the foot is merely the prime mover of the spinning wheel, while the hand working with the spindle and drawing and twisting performs the real operation of spinning. It is this last part of the handicraftsman's implement that is first seized upon by the Industrial Revolution leaving to the workman, in addition to his new labor of watching the machine with his eyes and correcting its mistakes with his hands, the merely mechanical part of being the moving power. On the other hand, implements in regard to which man has always acted as a simple motive power, as for instance by turning the crank of a mill, footnote 7. Moses says, quote, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads the corn, end of quote. The Christian philanthropists of Germany, on the contrary, fastened a wooden board round the necks of the serfs whom they used as a motive power for grinding, in order to prevent them from putting flour into their mouths with their hands. End of footnote 7. By pumping, by moving up and down the arm of a bellows, by pounding with a mortar, etc., such implements soon call for the application of animals, water, footnote 8. It was partly the want of streams with a good fall on them, and partly their battles with superabundance of water in other respects, that compelled the Dutch to resort to wind as a motive power. The windmill itself they got from Germany, where its invention was the origin of a pretty squabble between the nobles, the priests, and the emperor, as to which of those three the wind belonged. The air makes bondage, was the cry in Germany, at the same time that the wind was making Holland free. What it reduced to bondage in this case was not the Dutchman, but the land for the Dutchman. In 1836, 12,000 windmills of 6,000 horsepower were still employed in Holland to prevent two-thirds of the land from being reconverted into morasses. End of footnote 8. And wind as motive powers. Here and there, long before the period of manufacture, and also to some extent during that period, these implements pass over into machines, but without creating any revolution in the mode of production. It becomes evident in the period of modern industry that these implements, even under their form of manual tools, are already machines. For instance, the pumps with which the Dutch in 1836 and 7 emptied the Lake of Harlem were constructed on the principle of ordinary pumps, the only difference being that their pistons were driven by cyclopean steam engines instead of by men. The common and very imperfect bellows of the blacksmith is in England occasionally converted into a blowing engine by connecting its arm with a steam engine. The steam engine itself, such as it was at its invention during the manufacturing period at the close of the 17th century, and such as it continued to be down to 1780, footnote 9, it was indeed very much improved by Watt's first so-called single-acting engine, but in this form it continued to be a mere machine for raising water and the liquor from salt mines. End of footnote 9. Did not give rise to any industrial revolution. It was, on the contrary, the invention of machines that made a revolution in the form of steam engines necessary. As soon as man, instead of working with an implement on the subject of his labor, becomes merely the motive power of an implement machine, it is a mere accident that motive power takes the disguise of human muscle, and it may equally well take the form of wind, water, or steam. Of course, this does not prevent such a change of form from producing great technical alterations in a mechanism that was originally constructed to be driven by man alone. Nowadays, all machines that have their way to make, such as sewing machines, bread-making machines, etc., are, unless from their very nature their use on a small scale is excluded, constructed to be driven both by human and by purely mechanical motive power. The machine which is the starting point of the Industrial Revolution supersedes the workman, who handles a single tool, by a mechanism operating with a number of similar tools, and set in motion by a single motive power whatever the form of that power may be. Footnote 10. Quote, 
The union of all these simple instruments, set in motion by a single motor, constitutes a machine. End of quote. Babbage, location cited. End of footnote 10. Here we have the machine, but only as an elementary factor of production by machinery. Increase in the size of the machine and in the number of its working tools calls for a more massive mechanism to drive it. And this mechanism requires, in order to overcome its resistance, a mightier moving power than that of man, apart from the fact that man is a very imperfect instrument for producing uniform continued motion. But assuming that he is acting simply as a motor, that a machine has taken the place of his tool, it's evident that he can be replaced by natural forces. Of all the great motors handed down from the manufacturing period, horsepower is the worst, partly because a horse has a head of his own, partly because he is costly, and the extent to which he is applicable in factories is very restricted. Footnote 11. In January 1861, John C. Morton read before the Society of Arts a paper on the forces employed in agriculture. He there states, quote, Every improvement that furthers the uniformity of the land makes the steam engine more and more applicable to the production of pure mechanical force. Horsepower is requisite wherever crooked fences and other obstructions prevent uniform action. These obstructions are vanishing day by day. For operations that demand more exercise of will than actual force, the only power applicable is that controlled every instant by the human mind, in other words, manpower. End of quote. Mr. Morton then reduces steam power, horse power, and man power to the unit in general use for steam engines, namely, the force required to raise 33,000 pounds one foot in one minute, and reckons the cost of one horse power from a steam engine to be three pence, and from a horse to be five and a half pence per hour. Further, if a horse must fully maintain its health, it can work no more than eight hours a day. Three at the least out of every seven horses used on tillage land during the year can be dispensed with by using steam power at an expense not greater than that which the horses dispensed with would cost during the three or four months in which alone they can be used effectively. Lastly, steam power, in those agricultural operations in which it can be employed, improves, in comparison with horsepower, the quality of the work. To do the work of a steam engine would require 66 men at a total cost of 15 shillings an hour, and to do the work of a horse, 32 men at a total cost of 8 shillings an hour. End of footnote 11. Nevertheless, the horse was extensively used during the infancy of modern industry. This is proved as well by the complaints of contemporary agriculturists as by the term horsepower, which has survived to this day as an expression for mechanical force. Wind was too inconstant and uncontrollable, and besides, in England, the birthplace of modern industry, the use of water power preponderated even during the manufacturing period. In the 17th century, attempts had already been made to turn two pairs of millstones with a single water wheel, but the increased size of the gearing was too much for the water power, which had now become insufficient, and this was one of the circumstances that led to a more accurate investigation of the laws of friction. In the same way, the irregularity caused by the motive power in mills that were put in motion by pushing and pulling a lever led to the theory and the application of the flywheel, which afterwards plays so important a part in modern industry. Footnote 12. Foulhaber, 1625. De Cause, 1688. End of footnote 12. In this way, during the manufacturing period, were developed the first scientific and technical elements of modern mechanical industry. Arkwright's throstle spinning mill was from the very first turned by water. But for all that, the use of water as a predominant motive power was beset with difficulties. It could not be increased at will. It failed at certain seasons of the year, and above all, it was essentially local. Footnote 13. The modern turbine frees the industrial exploitation of water power from many of its former fetters. End of footnote 13. Not till the invention of Watt's second and so-called double-acting steam engine was a prime mover found that begot its own force by the consumption of coal and water, 
whose power was entirely under man's control, that was mobile and a means of locomotion, that was urban and not like the water-wheel rural, that permitted production to be concentrated in towns instead of, like the water-wheels, being scattered up and down the country. Footnote 14. Quote, in the early days of textile manufacturers, the locality of the factory depended upon the existence of a stream having a sufficient fall to turn a water-wheel. And although the establishment of the water-mills was the commencement of the breaking up of the domestic system of manufacture, yet the mills necessarily situated upon streams, and frequently at considerable distances the one from the other, form part of a rural rather than an urban system. And it was not until the introduction of the steam power as a substitute for the stream that factories were congregated in towns, and localities where the coal and water required for the production of steam were found in sufficient quantities. The steam engine is the parent of manufacturing towns. End of quote. A. Redgrave in Reports of the Inspector of Factories, 30th April, 1860, page 36. End of footnote 14 that was of universal technical application, and, relatively speaking, little affected in its choice of residence by local circumstances. The greatness of Watt's genius showed itself in the specification of the patent that he took out in April 1784. In that specification his steam engine is described not as an invention for a specific purpose, but as an agent universally applicable in mechanical industry. In it he points out applications, many of which, as for instance the steam hammer, were not introduced till half a century later. Nevertheless, he doubted the use of steam engines in navigation. His successors, Bolton and Watt, sent to the exhibition of 1851 steam engines of colossal size for ocean steamers. As soon as tools had been converted from being manual implements of man into implements of a mechanical apparatus of a machine, the motive mechanism also acquired an independent form entirely emancipated from the restraints of human strength. Thereupon the individual machine that we have hitherto been considering sinks into a mere factor in production by machinery. One motive mechanism was now able to drive many machines at once. The motive mechanism grows with the number of the machines that are turned simultaneously, and the transmitting mechanism becomes a wide-spreading apparatus. We now proceed to distinguish the cooperation of a number of machines of one kind from a complex system of machinery. In the one case, the product is entirely made by a single machine, which performs all the various operations previously done by one handicraftsman with his tool as, for instance, by a weaver with his loom, or by several handicraftsmen successively, either separately, or as members of a system of manufacture. Footnote 15. From the standpoint of division of labor in manufacture, weaving was not simple, but on the contrary, complicated manual labor, and consequently the power loom is a machine that does very complicated work. It's altogether erroneous to suppose that modern machinery originally appropriated those operations alone which division of labor had simplified. Spinning and weaving were, during the manufacturing period, split up into new species, and the implements were modified and improved, but the labor itself was in no way divided, and it retained its handicraft character. It's not the labor, but the instrument of labor, that serves as the starting point of the machine. End of footnote 15. For example, in the manufacture of envelopes, one man folded the paper with a folder, another laid on the gum, a third turned the flap over on which the device is impressed, a fourth embossed the device, and so on. And for each of these operations the envelope had to change hands. One single envelope machine now performs all these operations at once, and makes more than 3,000 envelopes in an hour. In the London exhibition of 1862, there was an American machine for making paper cornets. It cut the paper, pasted, folded, and finished three hundred in a minute. Here the whole process, which, when carried on as manufacture, was split into and carried out by a series of operations, is completed by a single machine working a combination of various tools. Now, whether such a machine be merely a reproduction of a complicated manual implement, or a combination of various simple implements specialized by manufacture, in either case, in the factory, i.e. in the workshop in which machinery alone is used, we meet again with simple cooperation. 
and leaving the workman out of consideration for the moment, this cooperation presents itself to us in the first instance as a conglomeration in one place of similar and simultaneously acting machines. Thus a weaving factory is constituted of a number of power looms working side by side, and a sewing factory of a number of sewing machines all in the same building. But there is here a technical oneness in the whole system, owing to all the machines receiving their impulse simultaneously, and in an equal degree, from the pulsations of the common prime mover, by the intermediary of the transmitting mechanism. And this mechanism, to a certain extent, is also common to them all, since only particular ramifications of it branch off to each machine. Just as a number of tools then form the organs of a machine, so a number of machines of one kind constitute the organs of the motive mechanism. A real machinery system, however, does not take the place of these independent machines until the subject of labor goes through a connected series of detailed processes that are carried out by a chain of machines of various kinds, the one supplementing the other. Here we have again the cooperation by division of labor that characterizes manufacture only now it is a combination of detail machines. The special tools of the various detail workmen, such as those of the beaters, cambers, spinners, etc., in the woolen manufacture, are now transformed into the tools of specialized machines, each machine constituting a special organ with a special function in the system. In those branches of industry in which the machinery system is first introduced, manufacture itself furnishes in a general way the natural basis for the division and consequent organization of the process of production. Footnote 16. Before the epoch of mechanical industry, the wool manufacture was a predominant manufacture in England. Hence it was in this industry that in the first half of the 18th century the most experiments were made cotton, which required less careful preparation for its treatment by machinery, derived the benefit of the experience gained in wool, just as afterwards a manipulation of wool by machinery was developed on the lines of cotton spinning and weaving by machinery. It was only during the ten years immediately preceding 1866 that isolated details of the wool manufacture, such as wool combing, were incorporated in the factory system. Quote, the application of power to the process of combing wool, extensively in operation since the introduction of the combing machine, especially listers, undoubtedly had the effect of throwing a very large number of men out of work. Wool was formerly combed by hand, most frequently in the cottage of the comber. It is now very generally combed in the factory, and hand labor is superseded, except in some particular kinds of work in which hand-combed wool is still preferred. Many of the hand-combers found employment in the factories, but the produce of the hand-combers bears so small a proportion to that of the machine that the employment of a very large number of combers has passed away. End of quote. Report of the Inspector of Factories for 31st October 1856, page 16. End of footnote 16. Nevertheless, an essential difference at once manifests itself. In manufacture it is the workmen who, with their manual implements, must either singly or in groups carry on each particular detail process. If on the one hand the workman becomes adapted to the process, on the other the process was previously made suitable to the workman. This subjective principle of the division of labor no longer exists in production by machinery. Here the process as a whole is examined objectively in itself, that is to say, without regard to the question of its execution by human hands, it is analyzed into its constituent phases, and the problem how to execute each detailed process and bind them all into a whole is solved by the aid of machines, chemistry, and etc. Footnote 17. Quote, the principle of the factory system, then, is to substitute the partition of a process into its essential constituents for the division or graduation of labor among artisans. End of quote. Andrew Ure, The Philosophy of Manufactures, London, 1835, page 20. End of footnote 17. But, of course, in this case also, theory must be perfected by accumulated experience on a large scale. Each detail machine supplies raw material to the machine next in order, and since they are all working at the same time, the product is always going through the various stages of its fabrication, and is also constantly in a state of transition from one phase to another. 
Just as in manufacture, the direct cooperation of the detail laborers establishes a numerical proportion between the special groups, so in an organized system of machinery where one detail machine is constantly kept employed by another, a fixed relation is established between their numbers, their size, and their speed. The collective machine, now an organized system of various kinds of single machines, and of groups of single machines, becomes more and more perfect, the more the process as a whole becomes a continuous one, i.e., the less the raw material is interrupted in its passage from its first phase to its last. In other words, the more its passage from one phase to another is effected not by the hand of man, but by the machinery itself. In manufacture, the isolation of each detailed process is a condition imposed by the nature of division of labor. But in the fully developed factory, the continuity of those processes is, on the contrary, imperative. A system of machinery, whether it reposes on the mere cooperation of similar machines, as in weaving, or on the combination of different machines, as in spinning, constitutes in itself a huge automaton whenever it is driven by a self-acting prime mover. But although the factory as a whole be driven by its steam engine, yet either some of the individual machines may require the aid of the workmen for some of their movements, such aid was necessary for the running in of the mule carriage before the invention of the self-acting mule, and is still necessary in fine spinning mills, or to enable a machine to do its work, certain parts of it may require to be handled by the workman like a manual tool. This was the case in machine-makers' workshops before the conversion of the slide-rest into a self-actor. As soon as a machine executes, without man's help, all the movements requisite to elaborate the raw material, needing only attendance from him, we have an automatic system of machinery, and one that is susceptible of constant improvement in its details. Such improvements as the apparatus that stops a drawing frame whenever a sliver breaks, at the self-acting stop that stops the power loom so soon as the shuttle bobbin is emptied of weft are quite modern inventions as an example both of continuity of production and of the carrying out of the automatic principle we may take a modern paper mill in the paper industry generally we may advantageously study in detail not only the distinction between modes of production based on different means of production but also the connection of the social conditions of production with those modes. For the old German paper-making furnishes us with a sample of handicraft production, that of Holland in the 17th and of France in the 18th century, with a sample of manufacturing in the strict sense, and that of modern England with a sample of automatic fabrication of this article. Besides these, there still exist in India and China two distinct antique Asiatic forms of the same industry. An organized system of machines to which motion is communicated by the transmitting mechanism from a central automaton is the most developed form of production by machinery. Here we have, in place of the isolated machine, a mechanical monster whose body fills whole factories and whose demon power, at first veiled under the slow and measured motions of his giant limbs, at length breaks out into the fast and furious whirl of his countless working organs. There were mules and steam engines before there were any laborers whose exclusive occupation it was to make mules and steam engines, just as men wore clothes before there were such people as tailors. The inventions of Walkinson, Arkwright, Watt, and others were, however, practicable only because those inventors found ready to hand a considerable number of skilled mechanical workmen placed at their disposal by the manufacturing period. Some of these workmen were independent handicraftsmen of various trades. Others were grouped together in manufactures in which, as before mentioned, division of labor was strictly carried out. As inventions increased in number and the demand for the newly discovered machines grew larger, the machine-making industry split up more and more into numerous independent branches, and division of labor in these manufacturers was more and more developed. Here, then, we see in manufacture the immediate technical foundation of modern industry. Manufacture produced the machinery by means of which modern industry abolished the handicraft of manufacturing systems in those spheres of production that it first seized upon. The factory system was therefore raised in a natural course of things on an inadequate foundation. 
When the system attained to a certain degree of development, it had to root up this ready-made foundation, which in the meantime had been elaborated on the old lines, and to build up for itself a basis that should correspond to its methods of production. Just as the individual machine retains a dwarfish character, so long as it is worked by the power of man alone, and just as no system of machinery could be properly developed before the steam engine took the place of the earlier motive powers, animals, wind, and even water, so too modern industry was crippled in its complete development so long as its characteristic instrument of production, the machine, owed its existence to personal strength and personal skill, and depended upon a muscular development, the keenness of sight, and the cunning of hand with which the detailed workmen in manufacturers and the manual laborers in handicrafts wielded their dwarfish implements. Thus, apart from the dearness of the machines made in this way, a circumstance that is ever present to the mind of the capitalist, the expansion of industries carried on by means of machinery and the invasion by machinery of fresh branches of production were dependent on the growth of a class of workmen who owing to the almost artistic nature of their employment could increase their numbers only gradually and not by leaps and bounds but besides this at a certain stage of its development modern industry became technologically incompatible with the basis furnished for it by handicraft and manufacture the increasing size of the prime movers of the transmitting mechanism and of the machines proper the greater complication multiformity and regularity of the details of these machines as they more and more departed from the model of those originally made by manual labor and acquired a form untrammeled except by the conditions under which they worked footnote eighteen the power loom was at first made chiefly of wood in its improved modern form it is made of iron to what an extent the old forms of the instruments of production influenced their new forms at first starting is shown by amongst other things the most superficial comparison of the present power loom with the old one of the modern blowing apparatus of a blast furnace with the first inefficient mechanical reproduction of the ordinary bellows and perhaps more strikingly than in any other way by the attempts before the invention of the present locomotive to construct a locomotive that actually had two feet which after the fashion of a horse it raised alternately from the ground it is only after considerable development of the science of mechanics and accumulated practical experience that the form of a machine becomes settled entirely in accordance with mechanical principles and emancipated from the traditional form of the tool that gave rise to it End of footnote 18. Uh, the perfecting of the automatic system and the use, every day more unavoidable, of a more refractory material such as iron instead of wood, the solution of all these problems which sprang up by the force of circumstances everywhere met with a stumbling block in the personal restrictions which even the collective laborer of manufacture could not break through except to a limited extent such machines as the modern hydraulic press the modern power loom and the modern carding engine could never have been furnished by manufacture a radical change in the mode of production in one sphere of industry involves a similar change in other spheres this happens at first in such branches of industry as are connected together by being separate phases of a process, and yet are isolated by the social division of labor in such a way that each of them produces an independent commodity. Thus, spinning by machinery made weaving by machinery a necessity, and both together made the mechanical and chemical revolution that took place in bleaching, printing, and dyeing imperative. So, too, on the other hand, the revolution in cotton spinning called forth the invention of the gin for separating the seeds from the cotton fiber. It was only by means of this invention that the production of cotton became possible on the enormous scale at present required. Footnote 19 Eli Whitney's cotton gin had, until very recent times, undergone less essential changes than any other machine of the 18th century. It's only during the last decade, i.e., since 1856, that another American, Mr. Emery, of Albany, New York, has rendered Whitney's gin antiquated by an improvement as simple as it is effective. End of footnote 19. But more especially, the revolution in the modes of production of industry and agriculture made necessary a revolution in the general conditions of the social process of production, i.e., in the means of communication and of transport. In a society whose pivot, 
to use an expression of Fourier, was agriculture on a small scale, with its subsidiary domestic industries and the urban handicrafts, the means of communication and transport were so utterly inadequate to the productive requirements of the manufacturing period, with its extended division of social labor, its concentration of the instruments of labor and of the workmen, and its colonial markets, that they became, in fact, revolutionized. In the same way, the means of communication and transport handed down from the manufacturing period soon became unbearable trammels on modern industry, with its feverish haste of production, its enormous extent, its constant flinging of capital and labor from one sphere of production into another, and its newly created connections with the markets of the whole world. Hence, apart from the radical changes introduced in the construction of sailing vessels, the means of communication and transport became gradually adapted to the modes of production of mechanical industry by the creation of a system of river steamers, railways, ocean steamers, and telegraphs. But the huge masses of iron that had now to be forged, to be welded, to be cut, to be bored, and to be shaped, demanded on their part cyclopean machines, for the construction of which the methods of the manufacturing period were utterly inadequate. Modern industry had therefore itself to take in hand the machine, its characteristic instrument of production, and to construct machines by machines. It was not till it did this, that had built up for itself a fitting technical foundation, and stood on its own feet. Machinery, simultaneous with the increasing use of it in the first decades of the century, appropriated by degrees the fabrication of machines proper. But it was only during the decade preceding 1866 that the construction of railways and ocean steamers on a stupendous scale called into existence the cyclopean machines now employed in the construction of prime movers. The most essential condition to the production of machines by machines was a prime mover capable of exerting any amount of force and yet under perfect control. Such a condition was already supplied by the steam engine, but at the same time it was necessary to produce the geometrically accurate straight lines, planes, circles, cylinders, cones, and spheres required in the detailed parts of the machines. This problem Henry Maudsley solved in the first decade of this century by the invention of the slide rest, a tool that was soon made automatic and in a modified form was applied to other constructive machines besides the lathe for which it was originally intended. This mechanical appliance replaces not some particular tool, but the hand itself, which produces a given form by holding and guiding the cutting tool along the iron or other material operated upon. Thus it became possible to produce the forms of the individual parts of machinery, quote, with a degree of ease, accuracy, and speed that no accumulated experience of the hand of the most skilled workman could give, end of quote, footnote 20. The Industry of Nations, London, 1855, Part 2, page 239. This work also remarks, quote, Simple and outwardly unimportant as this appendage to lathes may appear, it is not, we believe, averring too much to state that its influence in improving ex and extending the use of machinery has been as great as that produced by Watt's improvements of the steam engine itself. Its introduction went at once to perfect all machinery, to cheapen it, and to stimulate invention and improvement. End of quote. End of footnote 20. If we now fix our attention on that portion of the machinery employed in the construction of machines which constitutes the operating tool, we find the manual implements reappearing but on a cyclopean scale. The operating part of the boring machine is an immense drill driven by a steam engine. Without this machine, on the other hand, the cylinders of large steam engines and of hydraulic presses could not be made. The mechanical lathe is only a cyclopean reproduction of the ordinary foot lathe. The planing machine is an iron carpenter that works on iron with the same tools that the human carpenter employs on wood. The instrument that on the London wharves cuts the veneers is a gigantic razor. The tool of the shearing machine, which shears iron as easily as a tailor's scissors cut cloth, is a monster pair of scissors. And the steam hammer works with an ordinary hammerhead, but of such weight that not Thor himself could wield it. Footnote 21 one of these machines used for forging paddle-wheel shafts in London is called Thor. 
it forges a shaft of sixteen and a half tons with as much ease as a blacksmith forges a horseshoe. End of footnote 21. These steam hammers are an invention of Nasmith, and there is one that weighs over six tons and strikes with a vertical fall of seven feet on an anvil weighing thirty-six tons. It is mere child's play for it to crush a block of granite into powder, yet it is no less capable of driving with a succession of light taps and nail into a piece of soft wood. Footnote 22. Woodworking machines that are also capable of being employed on a small scale are mostly American inventions. End of footnote 22. The implements of labor in the form of machinery necessitate the substitution of natural forces for human force and the conscious application of science instead of rule of thumb. In manufacture, the organization of the social labor process is purely subjective. It is a combination of detail laborers. In its machinery system, modern industry has a productive organism that is purely objective, in which the laborer becomes a mere appendage to an already existing material condition of production. In simple cooperation, and even in that founded on division of labor, the suppression of the isolated by the collective workmen still appears to be more or less accidental. Machinery, with a few exceptions to be mentioned later, operates only by means of associated labor or labor in common. Hence, the cooperative character of the labor process is, in the latter case, a technical necessity dictated by the instrument of labor itself.